time for the Yet Come On Show unsolicited material, and my co-host, Jeff Cole, is the biggest when it comes to unsolicited material. He has sent things to everyone, and nobody has ever given a damn. Well, listen, I've gotten some things lately, okay, after 30 years. Okay, number one, I'm on the Southside Ride. That's cool. I did make you an air personality before me. You were a weekender, and weekenders don't matter. No offense, if you're in radio and you talk up music, the same music, and you have to do it a different way every time to try to be creative, and your boss says you're not as good as the song, you're never going to make it in radio. And you're known as a DJ. No offense. Well, yeah, and you don't go from weekends to being an air personality in the same market. You're really the only one who's done that. Major market. And there was a show that helped me do that, uh, t- several shows, I-, I would say. But for you... Now there's a chance, and this podcast is about life, liberty, and the pursuit of show business. Now, does that mean you want to be a star? Do you want to make money doing it your way? Maybe. Are you an inventor? We will talk to anybody that throws spaghetti at the wall. The problem is, is there a stain on the wall or did it stick? I want to talk to successful people, but I want you to have thick skin if you come on here because I love laughing at failure. Yeah, you do it with me every day. I mean, it's fun. However, I will say... I do it, but I care. I, I know, I, and I, you've helped me with this, too. I will say our guest today would appreciate this. My RFK song yeah. was played on KABC last week in Los Angeles. Well, there That's you right. go. Now you know a little bit about our guest, that he did time in L.A. And it's a he, because you said it was a he. Yeah. It is. It's not a she. He hasn't had a sex change. He was always a he. And uh, he's a friend. And I haven't seen him in a minute, but you know what they say about friends? They're always friends. You don't have to see them every day. They're always there. It's like riding the bike. You can just go right back to it. Yeah, there you go. Until you get really old and you can't ride a bike anymore. So I don't like that analogy. You lose your balance, sense of balance. Well, you are 10 years older than me, so. Dick. (laughs) All right, here we go. I just want to let you know our show today is a guest from radio. Uh, He was a former comedian. That's how he got in. He's done odd jobs. And he came with thunder into this market. And uh, he was a friend. And I can't wait to talk to Eric Von Hessler. Eric, my brother. Well, how are you? Good to see you. (laughs) It's only been a decade. It's only been a decade. (laughs) Our first show, the guy goes, it's only been 18 years. Have I lost track of people or have we gone in different directions? A little bit of both, but it doesn't really matter as long as you come back together, right? doesn't really matter. And and I'll say about my guest, Eric. Eric loves his wife, loves his kids because he had them. Uh, doesn't really care about his neighbors, doesn't care about anybody that's not on the show with him. No, but it's kind of Eric just doesn't need the socialism. Uh, That was something we all had different things that we brought to the regular guys morning show. And I will say to the Atlanta market, that's what most of you know about Eric. There was a life before that we talked about on the radio. Mm -hmm. Um, But while we were here, uh, you know, Eric and I became friends because but I knew how Eric was. And we all have our own different little peccadillos. Yes. So I like to keep to myself. I've always been like that. Yeah. Kind of. I, like, I don't know. I feel like it's if you're going to do a show and the kind of show that we do is, you know, it's the whole thing's improvised every day. And so I just keep the energy for that. Like, I feel like in between shows, I might as well just like be laying in a casket in my basement, you know, in the dark. <laughs> and then, OK, it's time for another show. So you just sort but of what emerge. about the family? Do they get any show? Sure, of course. the family. I got grandkids now, man. So, I, you know, I can't I can't I can't ignore my family anymore. Wow. So. No, we're very close. Very, uh, I, I'm really lucky. I'm really lucky in that we have a, a good, close family. Now we have in-laws and grandchildren and. So mm. I got a lot to keep me busy. I'm not quite as, uh, I don't think I was ever antisocial. I think that's the, that people think that I'm antisocial. I just like to keep to myself. I don't know, there's kind of a difference there. I don't, I don't dislike people. You know what Eric was doing, and every town has it. I had a kid uh, that did it, and he was a couple years older. And you see him walking on the side of the road when they should be in school. And they usually have like a heavy coat, and they're kind of pitched forward, <laughs> and they're walking alone. That was Eric in his city. I walk alone. I walk alone. But you know what? Keeps me skinny. I'm going to help you with this one, too. He doesn't follow in the path of others. He goes where there is no path and leaves a trail. Wow. That was deep, wasn't it? That was well, deep. I, but I feel it, good about myself now. You say what you want to keep to yourself, but at some point you wanted to get into show business. And by the way, you know, our show, uh, the Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Show Business, yes. has a little Eric Von Hessler in the title because whenever I think of the word show business, 
I think if you're saying of radio is the bottom rung yeah. of show business. That's where well, I got it from, too. Thanks, Eric. <laughs> so, so, so. Well, I, wait, 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 no, it's the second. The bottom is circus clowns. Okay. I think we're a little bit above circus <laughs> okay. clowns. So, so let's go back. So, what, what, what was your first sort of foray into trying to get into show business, which ended up being radio? Yeah, I career. like that. I want to know where it started because I know comedy is where you were found, but give us the, the, the background. Like, Do you when mean did you like know? going back to when I was a kid or like thinking well, about well, it? Yeah, I, well, I, listen, I always wanted, I, I don't know. Like, I always enjoyed, uh, you know, I used to stay up all night long. My parents would let me stay up all night long. I'd watch the Jerry Lewis telethon. This is like 1973, 1974, 1975. And I would literally, I would stay up. I would pretend that I was the host of the show. That's you know, funny. and I would stay up with it. And I didn't realize that Jerry was, you know, taking naps and sleeping between two in the morning and six. <laughs> like, I, I didn't if he's take, up, I'm up. I didn't take breaks like Jerry. Like, I, <laughs> I, I stayed with it. And I would, like, in my mind, I would pretend that I was introducing people. I was like kind of that, uh, that idiot fun. in his bedroom, you know, kind of thing, pretending to do shows. I remember uh, I lived in Memphis in 1973, and we had, uh, like, a carport that had this, this kind of raised stoop to get in the back door. And I would I would stand there and like pretend I was doing a show on awesome. stage. And I'm, you know, my parents, I'm sure, thought that I was absolutely insane. You know, he gets that from your side. He's crazy. <laughs> yeah. and, and I didn't yeah. know your father, but I knew your mother. Yeah. And that was well, I didn't barely hardly know my father either. He left yes. when I was 12, so. It's Daddy issues. No, <laughs> uh, it's okay. That means if I if I if we were gay, I could sleep with you easily. Oh, uh, you'd be the first one. Oh, thank you. Because I, I always look for daddy yeah. issues. And you'd have I'm, a damn good time too, I damn promise right. you that. You you would be worth it. Oh, let me tell you. You, you would brag time. about it. You would out yourself because after it was over, <laughs> I had the best you, sex. you wouldn't be able to not brag about the, what happened to you, <laughs> how lucky you got. That's it. But, you know, Jeff is a fan. Both of these guys, I met Jeff in 1995. I was hosting something in Gwinnett, and he was in the talent show as a comedian. You started off at a com as a comedian, so that at some point you decided to, to start talking about your life. To take action. And do something yeah, I think that it. was, uh, so you talk about like, the first time I actually decided to do it. I was, in, I was living in Rochester, New York, and I heard about this place called the Outrageous Inn. And so it was, ugh, God, it must have been like 85 or something like that. And I was watching a lot of comedians. Even when I was growing up, I liked to watch the comedians on The Tonight Show. Like on Fridays, I could see it because, you know, it wasn't a, wasn't a school day mm -hmm. the next day. And so I, I kind of liked that. And, you know, in the early 80s, like, because HBO was coming around, you were seeing yeah. more stand-up comedy, and it wasn't just Richard Pryor and George Carlin. You'd see other people. And so, uh, oh, I was in a community college because I dropped out of high school. So I went and got a GED. Ninth grade. Ninth, yeah. Ninth I, grade. It's really, I should say, because when I say I dropped out of high school, people think, oh, he must have dropped out before he graduated. He I knew was, early. I was in high school for about 10 weeks. So I had, <laughs> so I, I got, went back I up, it. got my GED, and I was going to community college. I think I was 19 or so. And in Geology 101, uh, I sat next to a kid uh, I started talking to. His name was Steve Greco. And he was doing comedy at this place called The Outrageous Inn, and, which I'd heard about like a year or so before. I knew that they did that. And so I went down to watch him. And uh, and then, like, a buddy of mine, Mark Cooper, rest in peace, he decided he wanted to do it. And and I, I kind of, like, was in that uh, bunch of friends, you know, we'd write, you know, stuff. And he went up, and uh, and, and I, I love him. To, I love him. I love him. But I would sit there and go, well, if he's going to bomb my material— <laughs> I can do that. Wait, I, I can I'll, bomb I'll with my own better. material, you know. <laughs> <laughs> now, he and I and my friend Duncan ended up uh, being, you know, kind of successful in a little circuit uh, later on in a, in a group that we were in together called Spilt Milk. Um, so I went up and I did exactly that. I, I went up and I bombed with my own material right. for a, uh, a very long time. I'd have, like, little moments. I wasn't a good stand-up comedian, but I loved I didn't want to do I didn't want to do a, a, a normal job. Right. And whenever I say that, I think people think that I'm stuck up or something. I'm not. I I appreciate good work. I if you, I appreciate people who do good work, but you got to know who you are. And uh, I just I just wanted to be a around it. A so you, well, not, so something like I knew that I wasn't very good at it when I was doing it. But I just thought, I need to stay here. Like, right. I need to stay mm -hmm. inside of this. I was meeting a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I, would, um, I would meet, you know, uh, headliners would come through town. And even though I wasn't very good, 
they would gravitate toward me and we would, we would, uh, I would have friendships and it was like, they would know this guy's not very good on stage, but he does have a mind and, and he just doesn't know how to present it. That really was what it was. I, yeah, I was you learn to do that. You learn your style and that's kind of what, what you were doing as well. And I, yeah, I tried the same thing later on, but this is what in the mid eighties. This late? is yeah. like, it was his, uh, yeah. 80, so this is during the, the 85. Boom. To, yeah. This during, is the comedy right, boom. Right. See, so you could be an MC, right? Yeah. And I had a car. At one point, I got a car. And so because, and all you had to do as an MC is go up there for five or 10 minutes, yeah. not yeah. totally fall on your face. And then for the rest of the show, you just bring people up, right? Which we've all done so right. many times. So, and if you have a car, then what happens up there, like the New York State Thruway, so you get people who are traveling and you're doing like uh, Syracuse, Rochester, Buffalo, Niagara Falls, a few other things. And so... Because I wouldn't totally tank the show, or if, or if I sucked enough or too much, the headliner could rip on it. you, yeah. 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 yeah, or something, just go rip on you, or, or yeah. turn the yeah. night around. And but I had, a, but it was easy because I, you know, the, the whoever the same people would book all of it. So if you had the MC who had the car who could drive this thing, so I kind of I found you know a Your little niche. a little niche right there, niche 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 whatever. And uh, uh, yeah, I kept doing that until we started spilt milk. Uh, which was a kind of, you know, we called ourselves improv, but we kind of knew what we were going to do every night. It's a funny thing. Like when you do improv, um, crowds are not all that different. No. So if you set things up, you know, give us, a, you know, you know I, I remember one of our things was we would do uh, a, a version of Jack and the Beanstalk, right? And we would take, and I wasn't a very good improviser, so I was like the guy who got, I was like the middleman, you know? And I don't care where we were. I don't care where we were. Whatever. Every night we knew that somebody from the crowd was going to say that the beanstalk was a penis. Every night. Every night. Didn't matter where you went. So you call it improv, but you really kind of know yeah. pretty much where the audience is going to put you. And uh, and so there was there was some some local success with that. So I did begin to feel what it was like to every once in a while just kill and and have the audience, you know, sort of adore you a little bit. And then that's addictive. Well, speaking, that's addictive, and you just want no, that more and more. And speaking of kill, I think there's only one person that any one of us at one point in time wanted to kill, and that would be Larry Wax oh. of the regular guys. Uh, <laughs> well, we got there fast. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is, this is, he's, the, he's the transition into radio. Well, he yeah. is. So at some point, you were on stage, and you worked Atlanta, too. You came to one Georgia. Time. One time. One time. I love that story. Yeah. Uh, but then at some point, Larry... Wax of the regular guys discovers you in the club and wants to bring you in as a writer, not necessarily an air talent on his radio show. Right. Well, it, the, right. He need, he wanted ideas, so he just come. He was uh, first of all. I got to say, I'm going to be very honest about everything. But before we start talking about Larry, number one, you got to know I wouldn't be in this business. I would not. Oh, be I in know this that. Business. We if, both if, owe him. Yeah. That. If 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 he had not walked into that club that night and I didn't get that opportunity. And also beyond that, once we got to Los Angeles, um, you know, we started off. I I was a nobody, so you know, I like started off at like forty thousand, and he got sixty thousand. Know, no, no, more, no, a lot more. No, no, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I know his life better yeah, than he yeah, does. No, he started. No, I think I think Larry. I'm gonna give away his thing. I'll just tell you mine. But he was sorry, making, Larry. He, he was making more than me. <laughs> So, I think it was 70. I think it was was 70. it 70? Yeah, this is 95. That's not bad money. What bad money? No, um, so, and, you know, we were, uh, we knew when we, when we flew out there to, to, uh, for the first interview, uh, after we had the first interview and we went back to Larry's room, you know, we were, we started talking about things like money or whatever. And then at one point we just looked at each other and said, we're going to take this fucking job. If no they matter offer what. Us, if, yeah. I mean, we're, we're, we don't have work right now and this is Los Angeles and this is an opportunity. So we're going to, we're going to take this job. So I want to get that. And the other thing is when we were on the air at KLSX for about, I don't know, three or four months and it, and it, it looked like we were kind of the breakout show to a certain degree. Right. I mean, they had Stern on in the morning. We weren't touching that, but out of the other people, um, you know, Larry decided we need to go in and renegotiate. And he also decided, he said to me, we need to make the same. So we got the same agent. So I want to, I want to make sure I get that on the table. Um, before any other Here's the thing, negative Eric, stuff comes no, out. And, yeah. the, and the kill means you're just the guy in the room that disrupts everybody. It's not for real kill. Right. Uh, otherwise, he'd already be dead. I'm I know, a I know people. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, you know people who do it for a six-pack. Exactly. <laughs> so so he's alive because I don't want to kill anybody. Yeah. I do want to go to heaven. Uh, yeah. But uh, I will say that 
this the person that kind of starts the trouble? Because there was a point, and I'll summarize a little because I know your story. Correct me if I'm wrong. But Larry comes in, discovers you. You come on the show. You're likable. Everybody's digging you. Larry starts upsetting management and different people. Before you know it, Larry's fired. They ask you to stay. Yeah, it was sort of like that. And then you stuck around, and then at some point— it was over because y'all got knocked out, and Larry sends tapes, and you're on them, and that's how you got the L.A. offer. Yeah, yeah, I mean, basically, it, yeah, it kind of went that way. Which, I how mean, about that? He didn't even know Larry was sending tapes out right. with him on it, and all of a sudden, Larry gets a bite from Los Angeles, which, yeah. that's and Larry huge. was in Baltimore. I was in Rochester, and yeah. he called me. I, I remember exactly when it was. It was whenever, um, probably in the— somewhere around the first uh, few months when Apollo 13 came out because— mm. I mean, I had nothing going on at this point. I mean, I was going to, I got, I was going back to college. You know, I was twenty. You were working I at was Blockbuster, 30. right? Uh, was, was that Blockbuster? Yeah, that was Blockbuster time. My, I had a friend who was a manager, and he got me a job there. So I was thirty, thirty, I think. I, I think I was like thirty years old, and had nothing going on. And before, and Jane and I decided, I was still with Jane at that time. Jane and I decided that we were going to go see Apollo thirteen. And uh, when I, I remember going to the movie, and then we went walking through the park afterwards. Nice night and everything. And I got we got home. Answer and, machine. Answer machine. Larry was on the answer machine, and he said, you know, uh, kind of explained it a little bit that there was a little bite. Give me a call back. I called him back, and he told me it was L.A. and uh, this guy Walt Sabo was interested, and um, I'm going to have him call you. And I think maybe he called. Me the next. This is how fast this went. Oh, I, I was, know. My 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 wife was teaching at a daycare center, and we were making money uh, twice a week, uh, uh, just cleaning the daycare center. So this is what I'm doing basically for a living. I'm I've I've got a actually I was I was the producer of a ra- of a radio show that didn't exist because the next host was hired, and so I was just working for okay, this guy's going to get here, and I'm going to produce his show. Two or three times a week, we're cleaning up the daycare center. So I've got just absolutely nothing going on. I come back from Apollo 13, answer machine message. Yeah, this thing's going on. Okay, I want you to talk to this guy. This is a Sunday, I think. (laughs) And uh, I talked to Walt Sabo, and I guess he didn't hate me. And literally by Wednesday, Larry drove from Baltimore, picked me up in Rochester. I had no money. And and, uh, we drove back to Baltimore so that we could get on a flight to Los Angeles. That was Wednesday. And uh, Thursday, I think, so we, Wednesday night, we uh, check into the Le Rev. And I think Thursday, we have our first meeting with them. Friday, they hire us on the roof of Le Rev. That's always and, a nice spot to get hired. And then, yeah. And then, uh, uh, and I'm, I mean, I'm, I've got a dreary fucking life going at this point. This is, this is insane. Honey, put so, in your two-week <laughs> notice at the daycare. I think we got uh, something. And uh, so then I came back, and we had to be back in Los Angeles the following Wednesday, I believe, for an employee meeting that Cato Kalin was part of. And my life was just absolutely bizarre. So within a week and a half— and then on the Sunday in between, this I fun. still had to go clean. I knew that I was a talk show host in Los Angeles. But you, but you had, had to do it. I had to go clean the daycare center. And I don't want to, I don't think I did a very good job, I have to say. I missed some of the corners with the mop. I was like, fuck this. Let's do this. But, but, but the best story. When so a week and a half later, yeah. I'm basically in an employee meeting. Cato Kalen. Susan Olson, who was Cindy Brady, right. Ken Ober, who was the host of Remote Control on MTV a few years earlier, and I and, and you're like, what is going on? I have a friend who I haven't I haven't talked to in a million years. I used to work with named Joe Kaus, and I I came back from Los Angeles the first time I had visited Rochester a few months back, and he said, being on the outside looking in, looking at me, he described like it was like. Having a friend that you know doesn't have a driver's license, and then the next day you found out you find out that he's the next commander of uh, the space shuttle. Like, how did this happen? How, how did this happen? And, and Jeff, Jeff, one of the best stories. So Eric's like, yeah, I don't have this job, and then we go and we interview, and then that night we didn't have anything to do, and Cindy Brady, who we've all watched as kids. Her fiance. Oh no, no, that was after we got there. Oh, uh, really? But I yeah. love the fiance thing. Uh. Where he goes, 
I'm literally at his uh, her fiance's bachelor party, and it's, everything's going south. But Cato Kalin, the cool thing about the radio station you were on. By the way, he was hogtied, nude with a stripper. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a, this is a couple. This is a few, literally three weeks after the Apollo 13. <laughs> oh, that's like, uh, I'm, uh, she, uh, I'm, uh, she's Don't back do there. It's a bachelor party at her house. I'm sitting on Cindy Brady's couch, looking at her fiance. Nude and hogtied and having whipped cream uh, all over his ass by these strippers. And, and I just thought, wow, this is... Uh, this is good. This, you know, things have changed in my life. You know. But the family, I mean, it was just a great opportunity. And that's kind of what, again, this podcast is about. You never know when it's going to happen. Uh, you keep trying, you keep trying. They say you become successful because you tried one more time. Right. Uh, I, I don't know that I always believe that. But I believe persistence and also doing the right thing by people, relationships, I think in this day and age is more important. At your time, it's lightning in a bottle. That was for all of us right. how we got into this career. I fell into it as well. Jeff has pursued it, which mm -hmm. is odd. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, now that's falling into my lap. Yeah. Everything that I've... No, but then then somehow, you guys, the money goes up. You're working in L.A. But, but before you move on on, on that, in case we don't get back to it, what I would because, you know, when, in radio— and what you just said, a lot of we've all been on both sides of it. We're, sure. we're out, and then somebody else is in. And and I always say to people, it, you know, you talk about one more time, and you've heard me say this before. If you can't be on the field, be on the sidelines. If you can't be on the sidelines, be in the stands. If you can't be in the stands, be in the parking lot. If you can't be in the parking lot, be across the street. Like if you if there's something that you want, and and you also have to be. Uh, you have to be honest with yourself. We've all known delusional people sure. who want it, and they just you can see that it's not going to happen. But if if you believe that you can do something that you want, then just if you can't have the job that you want, get as close to it as you can. You know, I mean, that's that, and stay there. You know, until it becomes, you know, your wife's going to leave you, and you know, we. That's need where to Jeff is now, job. right? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've been, I've been doing that, but I don't think I'm delusional. Right. I think I have. Well, I don't think you're delusional. Been, either. You've had real jobs. Had, yeah, yeah. So I've got, I've gotten some, some, somewhere. It's just not. It's just taking See, a long I, time to get a little bit. Right now, the thing with radio is, you know, the whole transition sure. that's going on. Yeah. We didn't get hammered like newspapers and magazines that went extinct overnight. Oh, yeah. But let's face it, you know, the world's changing and radio's not what it was. And, you know, in, in even radio, you know, we're, we're, we used to be this much of the pie. And, you know, people are, you know, you get, you get 12 million views to watch somebody play a video game. Well, I can't understand that world. No, That's I not my world. Like but I, I, mean, I think I mentioned before, if my song was played on KABC, 30 years ago, I right. had record labels calling me. That's right. That's right. You know? it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very different world, and you have to, you know, I always think about it in terms of radio these days. I'm just like, well, I'm going to turn 60 in a few months. I can just, I don't mean the station. I just mean radio as a whole. I, if this whole thing kind of goes down, I can go down with the ship. But my feet will... I got friends who are drowning down there, but I, you know, I just get my feet wet before I retire. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I, you're drowning. Uh, if I was if I was forty, you know, I would have to I would have to realign. I'd have to I would not be able to look at this kind of life that I have right now if I was forty in radio. I don't, I don't think any of us knows what radio where radio ultimately no. is going to land in this landscape of it's free. Know, we do yeah. know it's free, and free is yeah, cool. It's free, but with a lot of commercials in a world where People, you know, people get mad now if you're if you go to a video on YouTube and the thing at the bottom says skip ad in nine seconds, like fucking nine yeah. seconds. It's supposed to be five. No. <laughs> I agree. And I have not done that. I have not held anybody. Nobody's being held hostage. We will mention. Yeah. Matter of fact, since you said that. No, live reads. That's yeah. a different thing. You that's can, it. We can have fun. Yeah. yeah come right. on. Bourbon Whiskey by Legends is a proud sponsor of this podcast. And uh, I'm about to celebrate a two year anniversary this summer. And I think it's the best 80 proof in the world because I took my time and I wanted to make sure. So it's See, that's sponsorship. Yeah, that, that was always there. Yeah, I'm talking about you know, Commercial. you know, people. You know, I don't think the people have much of an appetite for you it, know one after the other after the other after the other. I think live reads are great because you can space them out. You can, you can, you know, and 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 it's the person you like talking about. It. And you can, yeah, and you can you can continue to have the conversation around it. You know, yeah, that's you know what, what I mean? we do. 
Yeah, it's not like I'm a spokesperson for some competitor or something where I have to no. go, oh, it's not me. I... No. <laughs> so just like I bring up Joe B's out of nowhere, Bee Pollen, of all things, that's another sponsor we really? have. But bee pollen, believe it or not, is the ultimate vitamin because they don't add anything. It's nature. And bees fly around and touch everything. And they say the one thing, if the bumblebee goes away, our whole circle of life goes away. That's true. But also a lot less people get stung. I like to look glass half full. <laughs> I, I just want to talk to my sponsor. <laughs> don't listen to him. Uh, but yeah, JoeBees.com, J-O-E-B-E-E-S.com, another proud sponsor. But talking with Eric Von Hessler, before we even go forward to you coming to Atlanta, let's talk about exactly what you're doing right now and how people can listen to you. Uh, well, I'm doing a radio show on WSB. That's 95.5. And on Atlanta, the FM? On the FM, Atlanta, Georgia. There's the AM is still out there, 750, if uh, if you prefer. I think uh, most people do prefer the uh, AM. I listen to you on the AM. I still go to it because it's what I grew up with. What do you think, your audience? Are they AM or FM? Is it a split or oh, more I, I, FM? I, I think it's overwhelmingly FM. Over, I, I don't, wow. We don't even really. How do you listen to them? Do yeah. you listen to yeah, FM. Yeah. All right, see, yeah. I guess I'm the only guy still well, you know, on you, you enjoy losing shows when you go under bridges? Is that your thing? Well, it's, uh, it's so nice. I don't. <laughs> well, just, just about the time you're getting on my nerves bridge, I'm like, well, okay, okay, good. No. Finally, some I can get away from this asshole. <laughs> yeah, no, but uh, <laughs> speaking of that, Eric comes to Atlanta, and again, Larry, if you're watching this, you knew I'd give you crap. You've been on my podcast twice, and I've given you crap. But there are people out there in the business, and there are people that are just ungodly uh, when it comes to, you know, talent. And I'll say I've worked with two of them. I had Larry and Larry Light, uh, a guy, Jason, I worked with. If Larry had a son, it would have been him. But it's just, it's narcissism with a lack of confidence and, and just angry. But they're huge talents. And I just look at where the regular guys could have come. Atlanta, because I grew up here, and so did Jeff, mm -hmm. and so did my parents. Nothing has ever hit this market like the regular guys hit in 98. Nobody talked that way. Nobody did what we did. The studio, I was in the right place. There's no doubt. And I'll say thank you. I had been on Christopher Rue and the Wake Up Crew for two and a half years. I'd done John Boy and Billy for six months. Opie and Anthony come into the building. There's a chance I'm working with those guys. Mm -hmm. I meet them. They say no. Take a midday gig in New York. Second choice, regular guys out of LA because you've been unemployed. But you're running around with guys that are about to be huge. You're running around with Adam Carolla, Jimmy Kimmel, uh, you know who's well, on more Larry. They, they, they were more Larry's friends, but that no, was like a, I was like. By the way, they always liked you more. I doubt it. I don't think so. I, I talked with them one time. I think they did. You know, I always got the feeling that Corolla just does not dig you. Yeah, I, I, it, it's weird because I mean I'm not an idiot. I'm not saying he walks around thinking about me ever. <laughs> I'm not an idiot, but but uh, every every time like, you know, I know somebody who's been around him or whatever. He's just I. It, I always get the feeling like, nah, I never really cared for that guy. I love I you. could be wrong. I met you, and I'm like, okay, he, he's he's on point. But uh, the show comes to Atlanta in 98. Like I said, Atlanta, you know, has never seen anything like it. And you and I, I remember the day there was a point in time, because Eric and I just don't listen to other things. We focus at, at hand. I don't listen. I never listen to Stern. I don't listen to anybody. I don't even like seeing comics unless they're good friends. I don't ever want to steal anything. I like Coming up with I'd it myself. Keep it in, in, yeah, that yeah. way, because sometimes you'll have parallel thoughts. Right. And other people, if you have parallel thought uh, ideas and you express them and somebody else, it depends on who's more famous. It doesn't matter. They're always going to say, well, you took it from the, the guy above you. And if you know that you didn't, you feel a lot better. You know that people are still going to say that you did. Of course. That's fine. But Yeah, come on. I did yeah. not take it from Jeff Hollinger. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but I'll say that Eric and I one day were like, whoa, whoa, whoa. what do you mean Opie and Anthony do this? I didn't yeah. know. I was thinking we about this. We had that same thought. I'm like, what? I we're was them? thinking about that this, when I was driving here. Um, yeah, I didn't know that the FU line was taken from Opie and Anthony or Anthony. Because I don't, I have no... I don't listen to other shows. I never read trade papers or, or anything. Wolf of Ball Bat Challenge, too. Uh, yeah, that, yeah, well. Oh, that, was, that was kind of Larry's role because he was kind of the ringleader of choosing bits and stuff, right? He was, kind he of, was the leader. Because, yeah. I mean, I, and, and, do you know he tried to become our producer? Oh, yeah, you know, yeah. I, I, I always say if, if, if they all would have hired me mm -hmm. originally, there might still be a 96 Rock because the mistake wouldn't have happened. Right. And, and that's and, yeah. and they wouldn't have made that Braves deal. Well, hold on, hold on. The uh, the mistake I think 
is was because are you re- they the engineers changed some shit. So and we didn't know. If you talk about the mistake, people might not know what we're talking about. But well, we thrown the, off yeah, the air. Yeah, we got thrown off the air because we teased the FCC saying we were going to do the nastiest ever interview, breaking every rule. Uh, and we encouraged those to tape it and listen. The bit was let's do it. Backwards. Yeah, because we were going to play it backward, and we're, this is when uh, yeah, this was after the Super Bowl thing. Janet Jackson, Janet Jackson. FC, yeah. FC, FCC was coming down, and everybody was uh, recording it, including uh, yeah. our competition. <laughs> and Eric, if you remember, in that meeting, I literally said to our program director, who you mentioned on our radio show, Tim Dukes, and and Larry, I said, "Why don't we just do a nursery rhyme backwards and to whatever the one percent that downloads it and plays it back right? right. It's a joke. It feels stupid. It's yeah. a joke." Yeah. Yeah. And Larry's like. Quit being a pussy. Yeah. Or, or just go to another side studio. And do well, here's point. the thing. We had done many interviews. Like some, somebody's not available until 1030 mm-hmm. and you really want to. And we would pre-record interviews from time to time. Never so been a problem. There'd never been a problem. And I guess the board had been changed. They were doing something different mm. with it. And so I, want, I just want to make sure when you say that, no one that I know of made a mistake on that. Tim, it's just that yeah, yeah. this button no. used to be one thing yeah, and it was something else. Yeah, Tim Frazier. Tim Frazier was running yeah, the board. Yeah, that's not fair to say because I could have made the same mistake. Right. You I, would have, I, by I, the way, yeah. uh, unless you would have stopped. Here's what we should have done. I'm in a production room with Tim Rhodes because I'm trying to get off the regular guys because of Larry. I love Eric, but I'm like, I just want to, I just want off. So I went to Pat McDonald. God bless his soul. Right. We just lost him. Uh, oh, yeah, I heard about that. So sad. Uh, rest great, in peace. Great general manager. Love Pat. Great McDonald. person. Great person. Great yeah. person. But we're on the show, and I always loved Eric. Uh, anytime we went, we did the Super Bowl. We were in Miami for 10 days. He and I are roommates. I've seen Eric in his underwear so many times. <laughs> but but we always, I, we were like, stay together. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not rooming with him or him. Yeah. But, um, you know, I was just trying to do something different, but we're in there listening, and we heard the bleed through. So I come in and tap Virgin Murray. Larry looks up at me like, why are you in here? Eric's focused. He's not looking at me. And I lean in and go, I think there's two things on the air. And he's like, and he looks at everything, and like Eric said, it's an engineering issue. Everything looks fine. So he waved me off. Larry shot me a bird. (laughs) And I left the room. And I'm like... I slip into Rhodes. I go, I don't know, man. They, they say nothing's going on. Rhodes is like, well, I'm hearing it right, right now. Right, yeah. And Rhodes was the one who came in when it was we had done the whole thing. And he came in and said, that went out over the air. And I knew with the environment, the, the Super Bowl thing that had happened, I knew. The first thing I did is I went <laughs> to the uh, behind the glass there. We used to have those CDs. Mm-hmm. I just took a handful of CDs and. So I heard that thought. And, and uh, the legend is, you said, there goes my radio career. Yeah. yeah and I mean, he I threw knew. his headset against the yeah. wall. I saw yeah. him do that. Yeah, yeah. I knew. I, I knew that uh, there was no coming out of it. But I know it was an engineering mistake because when I came back, remember we were like off for three weeks and there was an investigation. And we had <laughs> yeah. to come in and do like a was investig- And uh, we came back in and it was the day that uh, I was told. I, I think we came in separately. It wasn't like me and Larry were together, I don't think. And uh, I was told separately that, uh, you know, we were going to get paid, but that, you know, we were done. And as I was leaving, or before I went to the meeting, the head engineer, I can't remember his name, apologized to me. And I didn't understand it. It's like, why are you apologizing to me? So that's how I know that they had made some Eric, I'm the reason you're fired. (laughs) Well, and and again, to the the Janet Jackson wardrobe malfunction, had that not happened, there wouldn't have been all this. uh, Probably would have been uh, two weeks, three weeks. Yeah, yeah, that. It might have just just gone by and no one had said another word, but because they were so afraid about losing their license and the FCC coming down on Clear Channel, they're like, okay. And we were dominating. We were dominating at the time. Oh, dominating. And and because you weren't and you left, they made the Braves deal, and I think that also ultimately killed 96 Rock. Yeah, that was a terrible deal. You don't put baseball don't, on FM. And I don't think they would have had you guys still been on because you were killed. Right, right. And so back to his original thing, he got me in the door at 96 Rock because I heard you were hiring the producer, which mm-hmm. ultimately was, was Virgin Murray. He got me in the door, and I got an interview and came and saw the show one morning, and then that's how I met Tim Dukes and ended up getting hired for— you know, Right, oh, okay. So that's how I got in the door— through him. The so. Radio Boy, we almost had Fred Toucher. I tried to get Toucher back, but Larry turned down Toucher and took Radio Boy. And then when uh, I tried, then he came in. Fred Toucher. <laughs> yeah, Fred Toucher. He's a hot mess. Tr- he's I, killing he's it in Boston. He's, he's a trip. I love him. And I worked with him at his first radio job, too, at this little tiny station in Cumming, Georgia, back Which right is when he sent when me guys, the application, yeah. and I called Larry on New Year's Eve, and I'm like, I think we should do it with Fred. And Larry goes, call him, call him. Called up Fred. He goes, Hey man, 99X just gave me weekends and a, and a night show. I'm going to stay right, there. Right. And then 
It's so, when you look at everything. My friend one, Toucher would call you, he'd get so angry about shit. Oh, I know. It's, I mean, I, listen, I, I don't, I, 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 lo- I haven't talked to Fred Toucher since he left town, and he's doing very well. He Boston, came on right? our, yeah, he came on our show with Axel and I because he came back. You know, he and Axel mm-hmm. are friends. He was on with us um, in twenty two, and uh, we got updated on everything. And now Rich has left, and he's on yeah. the show by himself in yeah. Boston. But my neighbors listen to him. I always thought he was a, a, a really great radio talent, but he would call me sometimes because he was not getting along with the brass at ninety nine X and. He would get so angry, like, dude, just you're just not gonna chill. be able to, you're not gonna be able to it's solve this. It's a corporate company. Uh, he would get so mad, um, but uh, yeah, he's doing great, right? He went up there years ago. He's doing. He's great. killed it. I know. I've heard there's some this and that's, but of course. he's doing great. He's know. going through it. Uh, yeah, yeah it, 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 you always find out if somebody's you know drunk or they're dealing with this or dealing with that. But the thing is about radio talent, and Jeff, you may not be this. Eric and I, for sure, we're all broken in one way or the other. I was attention deficit disorder and hyperactive and was always had to be in, in front of people and I would do anything and concentrating on what I was supposed to be doing wasn't working. And my dad left when I was 12, so I needed validation. Well, I, What's I your think, deal, Jen? I, I think the reason- Are you that, hiding? Are you homo? No. The, the, <laughs> the, I think the reason that I'm having a hard time, you know, because my nickname is I'm the hardest working man trying to get into show business. Right. Yes. So I think because my childhood was so good. Mm-hmm. My, I have no no child to try. Yeah, there's show, something but, to that, and and, and uh, I would even say I didn't. Some people peak in high school. I actually peaked in middle school. Oh, you were the man. So I, yeah, I was a skater. So I was oh, like, okay. I was oh wow, you can you can do the crossover so when you're roller yeah, skating with all that stuff. Oh, uh, you could go backwards. So I think yeah, of course. So, <laughs> so I think that's why I'm having a hard time getting into show business because my childhood was too good. <laughs> and, and at this point, <laughs> I'd like possible. to. That's true. No, and at this point, I'd like to mention another great sponsor, and that would be Dr. David Markwell. If you think you're ever having these issues, Eric, I don't know what you're going through right now because you seem to be very successful to me, and you always have been. Outside yes. of a couple of firings. Yeah. But David Markwell, go to markwelltherapy.com. Uh, Ridgeline Counseling has two offices, one in Marietta, one in, uh, in, in, in Blue. What's up top? Uh, Ridge? Blue Ridge. Yeah, thank you. He's up there. I don't know why on vacation you'd go see a counselor, but you never know. But he's there because he has a place there. Mm-hmm. But uh, he's incredible. Go again to markwelltherapy.com. Love, love him. David Markwell, great guy. He's got the word well right in his name. Thank you. That's pretty damn good. When you're well. You're, he's you're, doing he, what he's supposed to be doing. He'll make you well. He actually gave me, you know, and Eric had a funny thing. He said, I'm addicted to strange. You never thought I'd get married, but I did. And then Eric goes, I don't need to come to your wedding. I mean, I love you, and you know I love you, but I don't need to come to your wedding. <laughs> I don't like weddings. I'm not a fan of weddings. <laughs> but I finally got married. I, I yes. met the right one. But until then, I don't know. I was living vicariously through you guys because— the regular guys, Larry and Eric, bigger than life, coming out of L.A., which that two years really helped you guys, and it got you a great job. Banking money. Banking money. We can say that. Well, that I was, was a hell of a run. It was a hell of a run. Oh, so, yeah. Uh, it yeah. Was, yeah, it was good money. No, without, Jeff, this without, is like, you know, you got Burt money and you got regular guy money. It's yeah, there. It, it just, then you had to get specific. But So by the time you came to Atlanta, you and Larry kind of were equal. Like you, you and, and, and I have to say, that was Larry's idea. That's great. Yeah, we, were, we got the same age. But they were equal we, talents, too. They're just different. You know, yeah. Eric, Eric always, always, I, this is how I describe you. And it's funny, I use a Brady Bunch analogy, knowing that you know Cindy Brady, technically. Well, it did. Yeah, it did. Uh, yeah. But it's like, he was the father. You know how the father on the show was a Shakespearean actor and had yeah. so much more to offer? And he's winning doing this stupid sitcom. <laughs> Being a dad with three kids, three kids. Eric got, I know he was over the TNA. He was over oh, half nice. the content, all the stupid stuff that we were doing, whether it was girls copying the man show, bouncing on trampolines. Whether it was Wolfle Ball Challenge, if you don't know what that is, look geez, it up. Look it up. I ain't talking Interviewing about Interviewing porn stars. Interviewing porn stars. He wanted to do something different. And that's where he started doing the news and getting into it. And that's exactly where you landed. But I always said that that was frustration for you because you were so much more. You could do that show with your eyes closed. And we all had our lane and everybody was living vicariously through me, which made it impossible for me to have a relationship. Right. I just had to have sex with somebody different every day. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I actually I didn't I didn't care for that part of it either I because know. I thought you know I, no every time I would but meet, you didn't think bad of me did no, you no 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 I thought like every time I met a new girlfriend I'm like how long is it gonna be before the show destroys this I mean every time you would introduce me to a new girl I would that's the first thing I thought how so, long before the show destroys this because I mean sure some people can handle that but not but everybody not ev- not most people. No. So and it's certain and, and it's funny because I think at first your girlfriends would be somewhat enamored with it. 
yeah. not, not knowing how harsh it was going to be, because no one could imagine. No one could imagine how harsh and, and intrusive into your life this is going to become. And that was really, not just with your, but with all of us, you know, I, you know, Larry and I are two very different people. And I think that that helped us for a long time. But I, I do not, I didn't think then, and I've never thought that you have to sort of grind your cell, your nerves all the way down in order to produce a good show. And like putting people on the spot all the time, every once in a while, I guess it's good, but we were, we were grinding each other down by going, it's almost like people now who, uh, like these content creators mm -hmm. who get burnt out after a year, even if they're doing well, because it's like, well, what am I going to do next? And, I, and I, now the last thing was outrageous, but people are oh. used to that. Now the next thing's got to be more outrageous. Than, and you just Our lives were on the line. Burn yourself out. You burn yourself out. I got in very early on here in the run in Atlanta. Um, you know, we were, just, we were just killing everything. I would, I would listen to WSB back then on the way to work. And I, that's where all, we all get yeah, our news. By like the way. a year or two, like I think it was like a year in, I heard them run a promo that obviously was directed at us. We were on a rock and roll station. We may, I think we were still playing music, and I thought that's insane. Yeah. How, so and and the fact that we were just at each other's and the nerves are grinding oh, down. Yeah. I was thinking to myself, if it's not fun now, like when's it going to be fun? I mean, that this is more success stepping into a market that is completely foreign to us and having this kind of success and I'm I'm driving to work with a, a knot in my stomach. Same like here. what's gonna happen today? How am I gonna have to I don't think you should have to go into work and defend your life every day. No. I, and I don't think that's I don't think that that's necessary. And um so it's just it's just different styles. That was I mean that's a nice Larry thought style. it was Larry thought yeah. that I was lazy because I to me what I thought I wanted as the show, as we got older, I basically wanted the show to kind of go in the direction of the show that I have now, which is we're not 25, we're not 35, we're not even 45 anymore, you know? And we've got an audience that's going with us. So let's, but the reason they liked us when they were 30 is because we were reflecting life at 30. So let's just keep them with us and let's reflect, you know, now they're getting married. Now they're having their first kid. Now they're dealing with this kind of stuff. We can keep them. And I always felt that um, six hours of sleep, uh, a cup of coffee and the headlines, and let's go. Yeah, and and I, that's how I was gonna. That's how I was gonna do my best. And you know, people disagree on these kind of things. It was refreshing. Larry. Larry thought that that was lazy. Like yes, he yeah. wanted me. He wanted me to go out and do bits and bring back. I wasn't like do me, this. who was out four nights a week. I yeah. was already doing four gigs a week for five years. I owned a bar. He'll never know the stress I had with that. Getting uh -huh. phone calls like. We, we may be facing a lawsuit. We're out of money. We got to pay the water bill by Tuesday. We got to do this. Yeah. Got to do that. Here's my credit card. Oh, what's the balance now? Forty five thousand. Keep it going. You know. See, but, the show should have reflected re that. Yeah, but the I show should have reflected what, what was what, happening. What was happening in your life? And it might have actually improved the situation. I mean, when Bar Rescue comes in and I'm this close to getting it, and I go through the interview process, something might be going wrong. Right. But yeah. it's just like it was. It was tense, and that's what Jeff. You saw it, you know, because you were down the hall, but no one will ever know. I was scared, and, and I'll say this on the podcast, for success. Had we gotten the reality show, had we gotten this, had we been syndicated, the person running it would have turned into the most unbearable monster, and we all would have died due to heart attacks. Right. Yeah, I didn't see my—I I don't think I had that kind of fear with it when we were—that idea of having a, a reality show— I thought, well, I'm not going to be a part of that. <laughs> I mean, ultimately, I like that's it's just not my lane. I can't pretend. It was mine because they would have filmed everybody from. Remember Kim Zolciak? He was around when I was dating her. Yeah, yeah, it's horrible. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. It was so it's like so. Your show now is that the, the six hours of sleep, coffee headlines. That's jokes, exactly what it is. It's, I mean, we we. I mean, listen, we outline. You know, but what I when the show is great, it's uh, you know during the commercials, you know. I, we're looking at something. We're making jokes. Hey, Tim, you go in this direction. You do this voice. You go in this direction. Uh, you know, Autumn, you can come in. And that's as much as we know. And then we come back, and we've worked together enough where we can really make it happen. And I'm, 
I'm addicted to those moments of magic. And and in the regular guys, let's face it, there were huh. moments when you got rid of, but it was very rarely, the magic wasn't the wiffle ball challenge. No. The magic yeah. almost always was because we were talking about some kind of shit and it got funny and then it would, you know, I like those moments where it just goes into outer space, yes. where you're just like flying and you know that nobody else in America on radio is doing this. If we're doing the FU line, I found out, oh, there are other shows than and that I can't own that. That comes from that comes from being a stand-up comedian. Because there were people who wouldn't have any problem taking other people's material. And I wasn't that good. So I should have been somebody who was like taking other people's material, but I couldn't accept can't the laughter mm -hmm. if it wasn't I just like, I, agree. I feel like, well, what am I doing? Like, totally agree with I, you. I always thought the best parts of the regular guys when I'd catch you guys early, and it would just be the three of y'all yeah. just talking about whatever, whatever. Yeah. And that, oh, the 6 a.m. hour yeah, was the best hour. Those are my favorite memories of the original regular And, and, and I, then I started getting pushed, you know, further on down, and we can talk about that. I'm totally open about that. But. Here's the thing with you, and I'm going to ask you this and put you on the spot while sure. we're doing the podcast, because I know my audience, and I know people Mate, that first, I, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Thank you. And by the way, Eric, we'll be leaving with a bottle. All guests. I don't drink as much as I used to. But, but you can put it on the shelf. It's good. Or y'all can pour it. No, you're not. <laughs> by the way, the dude's only 10 months older. I just turned 59. I'll be 60 uh, in May. Yeah, I know it's coming. But uh, I, we would love to have you back. I'll, like, sooner than you think. Just because I think people are thirsty for this. And I'm sitting next to a guy that uh, did make it, in my opinion, 100%. So he threw material. He made it. I know the salary you've made. I, I came close to y'all's salary uh, in 2017. It's a, it was a big, big number. And then I love the fact that when I got hired with y'all in 2008 to come back, which I I was like, I'm staying in country radio. I'm not doing this. Right. I'll stay with rhubarb going, no, 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 South Time. We don't, <laughs> we don't cuss on the radio. I'm like, do you know what I come from? Of course, I'm rest a, in peace. Yeah, rest in peace. But uh, rest in peace. We got a lot of people died on this, bro. Uh, that's, 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 uh, we're getting old. But then Larry <laughs> names me a regular guy on 2008. Uh, the day, the day I come in, and then John Dickey literally calls me and goes, "I'll be honest with you. Had he named you a regular guy, you know, a week ago, you'd have made a little bit more money on the initial contract." Mm. I'm like, "Damn!" But I never mind. Y'all, the first year there was yeah. decent. It I, was. I enjoyed the first year. Yeah, and then after that, it Me got when. Remember us going to that? McDonald's all the time with the critic. Oh no no no! I'm talking about the second. Oh, they're talking about 2008. Oh no, the first time. The first time <laughs> to meet Eric. Eric goes, let's go eat. I went to eat lunch with him every day. It was me, him, and the critic, who was a great guy who was narcoleptic and was on in Charleston for a long time. Yeah. Fell asleep with me at a bar and told me the night he was leaving. He goes, and still said, you want to give me a ride home? Give him a ride home. I went in. He had five T-shirts on a hanger, one jacket, two pair of shoes. Put it all in a suitcase and was. I love you know what he was a character and I loved him he he was he was not into what it, I, I don't think he was into it, not just the show I think maybe some aspects of the show he was into but Atlanta and that whole th he liked Charleston he liked he liked it he he didn't have these grand am ambitions no he liked. Wasn't it's about money. It wasn't. It was about lifestyle. And there's nothing wrong with that. And we all did 98 uh, for 10 days in Miami. There's so much to talk with. I just want to say, Eric, uh, you know, to me, and I, and I always say this about the regular guys, I said, if you weren't sitting to my right or to my left, because we, we swapped seats, I couldn't have done it. Yeah, well, the same is true. Uh, same I, is I'm true just telling you, you helped me <laughs> a lot. Uh, your face and no one else coming I remember there. the first time, and... And again, I, I just, anytime I talk about Larry, I want people to understand. I do not have, I was very angry when it all went down and I made that pretty obvious to people. If that was 11 years ago, something like that, you know, like. I have zero uh, anger. I don't have, I don't have any animosity. And, uh, mm -hmm. but I, I do think it's, I think it's, it's funny to go through. Oh, you know, it's hilarious. You know, you know, some of these things. And I, now I can't remember, I can't remember where I was going to go with the Larry. Uh, I have so many different Larry well, stories. Well, we were just saying sitting next to you and you were always there for me and you're saying that I was there for you too. Uh, you know, it was like somebody you could lean on, somebody you knew had, had your back and there were times you would step up. But when you're when you're a little dyslexic and you can't spell, now the right. more I write, the better I spell. I notice that, and I'm like, oh, I got this. But when you don't, like the spelling bee, and had to smell things, I'm like, yeah. it was like torture. The BB gun right. shooting, I had to pull. Oh, I do. No, I, I remember. What I, was, I, I knew was if I say, told enough stories. I, I, remember. I, I, I remember the so Shoot when Larry Steve. and I when Larry and I would come into a town, Larry was obviously the radio person. Oh, and he's so a radio guy. Management would always gravitate toward toward him, and I would kind of be like this. 
And after a while, I got to the point where I was like, it, would, it annoyed me at first. And then after a while, I would just kind of hang back and go. Because even up to the second time when we went, when we went to uh, uh, Rock 100, it was still kind of that, that same situation. It was. I would just lay back and go, they're going to come to me. Like, I, I wouldn't even fight. Like, it might be two months. It might be three months, whatever. But they're going to come to me. They're going to come to me. You're and the I, same one. And I remember <laughs> the first time that you got the full blast of it. We Ooh. were at the, uh, the, at the station in Claremont. We'd probably been here for about a month or something. And we were doing some kind of, we were in the production room trying to do some kind of bit or whatever. And whatever you were doing, Larry didn't like. Mm -hmm. And you were trying to talk to him the way you would talk to him for a month. Like, well, you know, blah, 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 blah. And he started doing this thing. He started doing that thing where it's hard to describe, but it's just, I'm not going to be satisfied with anything you have to say. And at one point, you looked at me and said, I, I don't understand what's happening here. <laughs> and that was the first month. <laughs> that was the first month. <laughs> Please tell me exactly what's going on here. Because she can be very charmed for uh, yeah. a month or he so. Was, he was so good for I a do, I Listen, I think Larry's very talented, and I do love him. I don't want to... I don't want to just go and just shit all over him. No, That's no. terrible. And he's not taking it that way right. either because I've had him on the podcast twice and I said things to him. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, dude, it's, it's, it's just true. And people know um, you can't take the talent away, but he's got to also realize how to work better with people. Everybody has their thing. But I will say to both of us, Eric and I, whether and, and I didn't know this until I worked with uh, Larry's son, Larry Light. We called him uh, Bailey. <laughs> Uh, he literally, that was his nickname to everybody, Larry Light. It's just nobody in the building ever liked this guy because he just wasn't like. There's a thing about radio, some radio people that you, you got to understand that it, like in the 80s, um, when the whole shock jock thing really got going in yeah. rock and roll radio, um, they were, people like that were so successful oh. and they got away with murder because, you know, you think about before the whole shock jock thing happens, you know, you're a rock and roll morning show. You're playing music. You know, you got a thing going. You're a radio station. But these people showed up and became stars. You know, like people suddenly were identifying with you. And a lot of them were allowed to get away with some behavior. And then after, mm -hmm. by the time you kind of morphed into the early 90s, it almost was expected. Yeah. Like, it's like, it's like these singers that they're expected to act like assholes and be a diva. And it's like, you get... The industry respects them yes. more, you know, and that's why you get. Tim Dukes told me, "Hey, man, he's horrible, but I've seen yeah. worse." Yeah, and they're what always. What kind of answer is that? You're my boss, and they're always afraid of uh, of losing their job. So there's like fear. There's yeah. fear. This that is that fuels working. That We're, this yeah. is working, and it was working. Uh, I will say, uh, we don't get the music. 99X in Atlanta, for those of you, if you know, if you're seeing this podcast, we're talking about Atlanta radio. They had the music. My opinion, we had the talent. How could you screw up? the guests that were coming in on 99X, the, right. the artists. Yeah. How could you screw that up? And that was the decade. So this was 98, technically through really about 2013, 14, yeah. that the regular guys, my opinion, we dominated. Uh, we had the best talent. And that's gone on. And to end the show, I just want to say that you've become an awesome host. I, I will say that I've become, Jeff, say it for me. Do I say awesome host? Pretty good. Awesome host. No. Nah. But I'm, I'm a I host. I find you'd be a very yeah. good host, yes. Yeah. But it's something that we learned to do that we could have done. I love the way you do radio. Uh, I love the fact that you took interns, which we wanted to get into, how yeah. Eric groomed them. And then he well, did in a good way, not in a good way. way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were touched lightly, <laughs> lightly, and always on their back, nowhere else. Yes. But uh, but you groomed them, and then when you were out, you did a podcast, and you and you structured it, and you paid them out of your pocket. Truth be told, and then you got them a job with you, and they work with you to this day. Afternoons on WSB, it's worth a listen. It's my kind of politics. The way they talk about it, they call it the way it is, but they do it with humor. Your hours on WSB are now four to seven p.m. Four to seven. You like that better than the midday slot? Um, I like uh, I like sleeping. So yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I I do. I, I we had a little more time to do stuff in the nine to noon. It wasn't as rushed as the uh, four to seven. Uh, four to seven. But it's uh, we should talk about the next, this next time about me going there and you know Pete Spriggs and Donna Hall and these people who you know had to kind of. Deprogram me and and uh, you oh, know let, let, let me know that uh, that I could you know that I could do it. And Pete Spriggs very early on, he wanted to put me on four to seven drive time, but I wanted to me I wanted the Neil Bortz 
Herman. To me, that was like mm-hmm. what I was listening to. And he, I remember one time he came. Herman Cain. We were only friends yeah. with Herman Cain because of Eric. This is when uh, this is uh, when State Farm was called Phillips. Still, I think. Yeah. And uh, he came. Pete Springs came to me and said, "You want to work? You want to work the dome, or do you want to work Phillips?" Like he couldn't understand why I wouldn't want four to seven. Um, but to me, it was the, it was the Neil Bort spot. So I wanted that. There was a little more time there, but it was once we once uh, Ken Charles came in. You know, he was like, you know. You, putting you there and mm-hmm. well, I mean he wasn't like that he no, asked no. me but um and so now I've pretty much ended up where Pete Spriggs wanted to put me in the beginning and uh I've gotten I'm I'm getting older so I've gotten rid of all the uh, podcasts and everything after a while I know we're, we're closing up here but after a, a few months ago like trying to do these podcasts and all these other things and, and then I realized all they want from me is three hours a day what the fuck am I doing and now I've just cut everything else out and I'd focus completely on four to seven. I get plenty of sleep. I sleep from midnight to about seven thirty in the morning. Awesome. And I and I can't believe at this point how fucking easy my job is. <laughs> I was making it way too difficult. <laughs> there you go, Eric Von Hessler, uh, air talent uh, known to many on ninety six rock as well as rock one hundred point five. Along with me and him, we're both. We were regular guys, and mm-hmm. we're going to talk more about it. We're going to talk about exactly what he's doing now, the people that he kept, and some of those stories. We'll revisit it. Uh, we look to have you back on in a few weeks. This is part one. Can we say that? Part one. Part one. Eric Von Hessler. I'm Southside Steve. Jeff Cole. Welcome to the Yeah, Come On Show. Yeah.